Hey everybody, Father Wani here. We are in Monday of the 14th week in Ordinary Time and we start a new book today, the Prophet Hosea. Now really we jump in straight to chapter 2 verses 16 to 18 and 20, uh, I think 16 to 18 and 21 to 22, okay? But I need to give you a bit of a run up uh, to the book of Hosea, which I'll do and then try to cover some sections of the text. Now straight away I want to tell you that tomorrow we are going to go to chapter 8. So it's not really possible to cover the entire book of Hosea like we did with the prophet Amos. But we will get glimpses into the text along with certain amount of reflections. And I will go as much as I can and teach you today. I don't want to cross, uh, you know, just don't want to go on and on. But we are looking at Hosea. Straight away, Hosea means uh, salvation. Uh, the root of that Hebrew word is Believe it or not, Yeshua, from where you get the word Jesus. Joshua is the Greek form of the name of Jesus. Yeshua is the Hebrew form. And Hosea, the root, uh, is uh, means salvation. So straight away you know the name of the prophet Hosea. He is counted among one of the 12 minor prophets. As I said before, like Amos, he's a minor prophet. Minor, not in uh, in message, but minor in terms of the length of the book, and so they are called minor prophets. Now, um, Hosea uh, comes onto the scene about 650 years after the Israelites entered the Promised Land, and about 250 years after uh, the Davidic um, uh, monarchy, the United uh, Monarchy that David established. Remember. That monarchy, that united monarchy of David uh, was followed by his son Solomon and then the empire gets split up into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Judah will have 12 tribes, Israel in the north will have 10 tribes. Now in this book you will hear Israel also referred several times, I think about 14 or 15 times to another name, Ephraim. Ephraim was one of the largest tribes of the northern kingdom. So God, through the prophet Hosea, will refer to Israel in this book uh, as uh, also Ephraim. Now, we learned of Amos the last time, and you remember last week I said I'm following uh, the dating that you find at the end of the RSV transla uh, translation of the Bible. And that dating put Amos at 787, and two years later, in 785, Hosea is on the scene. Both, as I told you, Amos and Hosea preaching to the people of the northern kingdom. But the difference is that Amos came from the southern kingdom and was sent to Bethel in the northern kingdom to the royal sanctuary. Well, as Hosea is from the northern kingdom, and we know this because in chapter 7, verse 5, he will refer to our king when he's preaching to Israel. So obviously, you know, when he says our king and he's talking to Israel, he's talking about the kings of the northern kingdom. Now, um, Hosea saw seven kings in his lifetime and practically all of them um, reigned for a short period of time before being assassinated. It was, uh, I think he saw a long line of, um, of a lot of bloodshed among uh, the kings. Now, uh, what else can we say? It's very important to understand also that remember Amos was sent from the southern kingdom to the northern kingdom and a lot of Amos's preaching and prophesying was about uh, social justice because as I told you the northern kingdom at this point of time was extremely wealthy. Remember the cows of Bashan? So they were extremely wealthy. Remember the prophecy in, uh, in uh, Amos with regard to the merchants yeah, in chapter 7. So um, at this point of time, politically, the northern kingdom of Israel is strong. They have well settled. They are not being troubled by their neighbors. They are economically rich, but they are spiritually wanting. And why they are spiritually wanting? Because we know that the northern kingdom and all their 19 kings worshipped Baal or Baal as we say, as we know. Baal or Baal can mean several things. Today in the text we'll see that one of the meanings could be husband or master. But we also know Baal as a proper name uh, was um, referred to the god of fertility. 
So um, we have already seen how Ahaz and his wife uh, Jezebel worshipped and promoted the gods, uh, the god Baal. So that's by way of introduction. Uh, let's get straight away um, to Hosea. And Hosea's, uh, the God uses Hosea, normally God used the prophets to bring about a prophecy. Here God will also use Hosea as an object lesson. Literally he will tell him, as we will see in the opening verses, God will tell him, go get yourself a wife of harlotry. Now uh, you're going to find a lot of this uh, language that we use in Hosea will might offend modern sensibilities yeah uh, it's often sounds sexist it is uh, it demeaning sometimes of the way women are portrayed but remember that these are metaphors basically uh, in order to make a point so uh, Hosea is going to be an object lesson of God's relationship with Israel yeah uh, Hosea will literally in imagine this like a play Hosea is going to take the part of God in the play and he's going to take a wife called Gomer who's going to be unfaithful and you can already see the relationship and the storyline of the play God through Hosea is faithful Gomer as Israel is going to be unfaithful so um, let's delve straight away into the book it says the word of the Lord chapter 1 verse 1 that came to Hosea the son of Beri in the days of now we are going to get the names of the kings of the northern kingdom, Uzziah, same king as in the prophet Amos, and Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah. So these are the kings, sorry, of the southern kingdom. These are, and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel. So Israel is in the northern kingdom. Sorry, I'm getting it a bit wrong. Israel is in the northern kingdom, and Judah is in the southern kingdom. So you have. Um, it's interesting to note that while Hosea is preaching in the northern kingdom uh, with Samaria as its capital, political capital, at the same time in the southern kingdom, Isaiah was prophesying. So you have Hosea and Amos prophesying in the northern kingdom and Isaiah who is prophesying in the southern kingdom. Remember the messages are practically the same. Yeah, uh, Each one has a different style. Amos came out very forcefully. And you're going to see that um, Hosea is very different. Yeah? Hosea begins with condemnation, but by the time we reach the end of chapter 1, there is um, uh, God is calling his people back to redemption. So in Hosea, you're going to see constantly in chapters 2, in chapters 11, in chapters 3, in chapters 14, you're going to see messages of redemption where God is going to ca call his people back. Okay? Um, so the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, we did that verse 1, let's do verse 2. Look at your Bibles everybody and if you don't, pause this video, get your Bible so that you can do this Bible study with me as rapidly as we can. Now, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of whoredom. This is in the RSV translation. Some translations have harlotry. So go take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So not easy words from God to say uh, and not easy for uh, Hosea to hear and to practice because he has to put this in practice. He, a righteous man, has to go and marry a woman. Uh, some say she may have not been a prostitute at the time of marrying Hosea, some uh, look at it as she was already uh, one of loose character. So God asked him to take a wife of uh, who is of, of whoredom. Now, remember, go back to that imagery I gave you of a play. Yeah, Hosea takes the place of God and Hosea is going to be the faithful husband and Gomer, his wife, who we will hear of. So he took Gomer, daughter of Dibla Lim, she is going to play the part of Israel. And if she's an adulteress, an adulteress is not faithful to the husband, an adulterous wife is not faithful to the husband, and in the same way, God is saying, you, Israel, have not been faithful to me. So she conceived and she bore him a son. Now, uh, Gomer will bear Hosea three son two sons and one daughter. 
But each of these names, remember this is metaphorical, so each of these names are going to mean something. God wants to communicate to his people through the names of these children, his relationship with Israel. So verse 4, and the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel. Now Jezreel is a place, we've heard of this, the valley of Jezreel, but Jezreel also means scattered. So God says name him scattered for in a little while. I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So God says, I am going to scatter you. Jezreel means to be scattered and through the name of the first child, God is con conveying a message. I'm going to scatter you. Now we have done who Jehu is. So you will remember in 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10, Jehu was the commander who usurped uh, the throne by killing the entire bloodline, the royal bloodline of the northern kingdom. Um, so you'll remember Queen Athalia that we did in the prophet Amos. So Jehu, the first child is called Jezreel, meaning to be scattered. Now let's go to the next verse, verse 6. She conceived again and she bore a daughter. So the second child is a daughter. Then the Lord said to him, name her Lo Ruhamma, Lo Ruhamma, for I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel or forgive them, but I will have pity on the house of Judah and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by the bow or by the sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. Now, very clearly, Lo in Hebrew means no. Ruhamma means pity. So God says, I will not have pity uh, on, I mean, what a terrible name to give a child, but God wants to communicate. He's not going to have pity. He's not going to have pity on whom? He says, I will not have pity on Israel, the northern kingdom. Hosea is preaching to the northern kingdom, to the 10 tribes. But God says, I will have pity on the house of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. Let me explain. We know that in 721, the Assyrians will come and destroy the northern kingdom. Then the Assyrian king Sennacherib will try to attack the southern kingdom. We did this when we did the book of two kings. Uh, he will try to attack the southern kingdom. And we know that the king at this time is King Hezekiah. Uh, Hezekiah will turn to Isaiah, who is the prophet, and plead. He will wear sackcloth and ashes and repent. and. God works a miracle. He sends an angel into the Assyrian camp. And remember, 185,000 soldiers are killed. You can read that in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. Now, just think about it. If God can work such a mighty miracle with one angel, yeah, when you are in need, uh, God has promised that he will send all his angels uh, to, to assist us. So never be afraid. But uh, lo Ruhamma, which simply means God says, first he says, I will scatter you. Then he says, I will have no pity on you. Verse 8, when she had weaned Lo Ruhamma, she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord named him Lo Ami, for you are not my people. Lo again is no, Ami is mine, you are not mine. So the first child, I will scatter you. The second, I will have no pity on you. The ch third child, God says, you are not mine. So God is now abandoning his people. God actually says, I am not your God. But remember when he made the coven covenant with his people, he said, I am your God. You are my people. Now God is so fed up. He says, I am not your God. So verse 10 onwards is the restoration of Israel. Uh, and you can see how we began with God saying, I will scatter you, I do not pity you, and I will have, uh, and you are not mine, to suddenly God's love. And you'll see this constantly in the book of Hosea. God does a bit of a U turn for his people. So, verse 10 Yet, yeah, uh, yet the number of the people, so you can see a glimmer of hope now, the number of people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can neither be measured nor numbered and in the place where it was said you are not my people it shall be said to them 
children of the living God. So you see the glimmer of hope, you see the restoration, as I said, you'll see themes of restoration in chapters 3, in chapters 11, in chapters 14. The people of Judah and the people of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint for themselves one head and they shall take possession of the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So what was scattered, remember Jezreel means scattered, God says what I scattered will be united. So in chapter 1 you see both God's wrath and anger and you see the promise of restoration. Now we have to come to chapter 2 because really our reading at Mass is taken from chapter 2. And chapter 2 really speaks of once again Israel's infidelity seen through the life of uh, Gomer. In fact, chapter 1, 2 and 3 will focus on uh, Hosea and his life. Yeah, And then the rest we'll, we'll do. So uh, we're going to see Israel's infidelity, we're going to see punishment, we're going to see redemption. Now I'm going to read this section to you, at least sections of it, so you can see how God in a way is really upset. Yeah, He wants to win over. By the time we come to the text of today, of chapter 2 verse uh, 14 onwards, you will see how God's greatest desire is not to punish. God's greatest desire is to win us over, even though sometimes he may use punishment as a way to winning us back. So he says in chapter 2 uh, verse 1, now this is very interesting. He says, say to your brother Ami, and say to your sister, Ruhama. Now remember earlier, it was Lo Ami, not mine, and Lo Ruhama, uh, not pitied. Now God is saying, say to your brother, who is called mine, and say to your sister, who I have pitied. So you can see immediately the change of God's heart. So don't miss that one in chapter 2, verse 1. So he says, plead with your mother, plead. So he tells the children, go plead with your mother, Remember, the mother is representative of Israel, so go plead with your mother Israel. Plead, for she is not my wife, she doesn't behave like my wife. Remember, uh, she was behaving like a harlot, prostituting herself to all the other nations. That what, that's what Israel was doing, so being faithful to God. Israel was literally, in inverted commas, prostituting itself to every single nation and doing their bidding. Um, so, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Or I will strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and turn her into a parched land and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no pity because they are children of whoredom for their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully for she said I will go after my lovers and uh, they give me bread and 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 my water. This was a lie. The, the lovers are the other nations. Who was it that gave Israel bread and water? It was God when they were in the in the desert for forty years. You're going to hear that line referred several times. So here Israel is saying, it is the lovers who give them bread and water and wool and flax and oil and drink. Therefore, says God. Now you therefore always indicates divine judgment. Therefore, I will hedge her ways with thorns and I will build a wall against her. Here is God talking metaphorically. So, I will build a wall, I will hedge you in and that's what happened when the Assyrians came. They built a wall, literally a wall of their army all around, hedging Israel in so that she cannot find her paths. Verse 7, she shall pursue her lovers but not overtake them and she shall seek them but she shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband. Who is the first husband? Israel. I will return to God. Have you noticed that we always turn to God when, when God shuts every door for us? Yeah. When we are hemmed in uh, and hedged in, then we tend to remember God. So I will return to my first husband, for it was better with me then than now. She did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine and the oil. So grain, wine and oil when mentioned in the Old Testament are always signs of God's uh, blessings. So God says, it was I who blessed you. Whenever you read grain, wine and, and oil, remember it means God's blessings. God says, she doesn't even know that it was I who blessed her, who lavished upon her silver and gold that they used for Baal. So my gifts you used for another God. yeah. And you can imagine how hurt you would be if somebody... If you give somebody good things and they just took it and gave it away to somebody 
uh, that uh, you did not like. Verse 9, therefore I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season and I will take away my wool and my flax which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her shame in the sight of her lovers and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. Now watch God's action because you will see the word I, 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 I. You can really see God a bit wound up. I will put an end to her mirth, her festivals, her new moons, her sabbaths and her appointed festivals. These were all the festivals that Israel celebrated not in service of Yahweh, not in worship of Yahweh, but in worship of false gods. Verse 12, I will lay waste her wines and her fig tree of which she said, these are my pay which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest and the wild animals shall devour them. I will punish her for the festival days of Baal when she offered incense to them and decked herself with the rings of jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, says the Lord. So you can see God from verse 11 all the way down to verse 13 is building up. I will do this and I will do that and I will do everything because you have betrayed me. And now you expect like the bigger bombshell to fall and guess what God does? He has a change of heart and this is why I want to show you, you know, that God constantly, even though he's mad at us so often for what we do and it's not God's fault, it's our fault. Yet the word therefore in verse 14, therefore, or as some translations have it, yet, what is God going to do? You would have expected a greater punishment. He says, no, I will allure her. The word allure in Hebrew is a patha, which means entice, to seduce. God is using seductive words, you know, words of love. So God will go at, to any lengths, even to seduce us, so that we come back to him. He doesn't want to break us. He doesn't want to break our backs. He wants us to come back to him. So uh, paradoxical, paradoxical as it may seem, the series of threats that we heard from chapter 2, verse 6, all the way to 13, has now changed once again to God saying, I will now allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness. Very strange way. If you want to seduce somebody, don't take them into the wilderness. But what was God referring to? He was referring to the fact that he had taken his people out of Israel into the wilderness where he cared for them. God is saying, I will take you out back to the place where I once cared for your people. I will care for you. So he will take them in the wilderness uh, and literally make them into a nation again and I will speak tenderly to her yeah from verses 6 to verse 13 in chapter 2 God was really giving it to them but he says I will speak tenderly for there I will give her vineyards all the vineyards that he said he would destroy he says I will give you vineyards in the desert that's the extent that God is willing to 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 go to to woo his people back and make the valley of Akor, a door of hope. You know, the valley of Akor, you have to read Joshua chapter 7, verse 26. Akor means trouble. Read that text. So, that valley which was trouble, I will make it also into a door of hope. There shall be, there she, sh she shall respond as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. So, 13 times in the book of Hosea, you're going to hear this reference when God says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, let's come to verse 16. On that day, says the Lord, you will call me husband. So see the relationship. So when I take you into the wilderness, when I give you your vineyards back, when I fill your life with every good thing, you will then realize that I am your husband. Once again, I will call you back to fidelity. So she will, you will call me husband and no longer will you call me my Baal. My Baal could translate as husband, it could also train, translate as master. So God really wants to have not a master relationship with us, but a husband and a wife relationship, that of a lover. He wants an intimate relationship with us. Verse 17, For I will remove the names of the Baals in plural, so many gods, I will remove the names. This woman, this Israel has been worshipping not one false gods she has been worshipping, Israel has been worshipping many false gods. I will remove the names of Baals from her mouth and they shall be mentioned by name no more. I will make you, make of you a covenant, that Hebrew word berith, yeah? it's not a contract, 
it's a covenant it is a relationship of love that's what god is saying i will make with you a relationship of love on that day with the wild animals the birds of the air and the creeping things of the ground you you go back straight away to genesis and that relationship that god desired for adam and eve and i will abolish the bow the sword and the war from the land and i will make you lie down in safety so god is saying you will come back to me and i will give you all of this god is saying i'll give you peace i'll give you happiness i'll give you vineyards i'll give you joy i'll give you security i'll give you everything just come to me just give up all the sin all the bals that you have been following verse 19 and i will take you for my wife forever i will take you for my wife in righteousness and justice those words mispat and sadaka in hebrew righteousness sadaka justice mispat these were very loaded words when you look at the hebrew translation in in steadfast love i will take you i will take you back in mercy the hebrew word hesed yeah in loving kindness i will take you back in loving kindness i will take you for my wife in faithfulness and you shall know the lord you shall know the lord so i've really gone um, very rapidly through chapter 1 and 2 tomorrow uh, i may not be able to do chapters 3 to to 8 but i'd request you to read it and i will do as much as i can god bless you father son the holy spirit amen i'm a bit out of breath and i tire very quickly when i have to do long teachings because uh, so much of my muscle on my right face really doesn't work Uh, it's a long lovely sunday i celebrated mass uh, this morning at grace church in margao i just do that once a month but i just want to tell you my sister her husband and my niece have now arrived uh, two days ago so i was running around with them trying to find a place we did find a place in moira just yesterday uh, terribly expensive but it's very close to my niece's school so things hopefully uh, in the next few days their furniture has to come from dubai they have to settle down I'm going to be running between Moira and here. Uh, it's going to be difficult, so I'll try as much as I can to be as faithful uh, to bring the word of God to you. If I do miss this week, do understand that I've had a long and tough day. Bye, everybody! Don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends, and leave your comments.